afternoon. My name is Emily Grassley, and I am the Chief Curiosity Correspondent for the Field Museum in Chicago. And don't be embarrassed if you have no idea what that is. Um, I'm actually the world's one and only Chief Curiosity Correspondent. So one of my most frequently asked questions then is, first, what is a Chief Curiosity Correspondent? And after I do a little bit of explaining, it's quickly followed up with, how can I get your job? Um, so today, uh, I don't necessarily want to talk about how I got to be where I am. The short answer is that you study art in Montana. You weasel your way into an internship at a natural history museum. You start a web series that gets picked up by a major scientific institution. And then uh, here you are today. But uh, today I want to talk to you about how we are all inherently conduits and correspondents of curiosity and how uh, learning that about myself has become one of the most valuable aspects of my life. Um, but first, we have a couple of questions. I want you to raise your hand if you have gone down a Wikipedia rabbit hole recently. <laughs> you all know what I'm talking about. This is when you like go to look up what the state reptile of Illinois is, and then a couple of clicks later, you're learning that New York City actually has an online form for picking up roadkill on your local streets. <laughs> And you're like slowly learning that millions of dollars are spent every year in the airline industry because of bird collisions. And you're like, I didn't know about any of this. That's, that's a Wikipedia rabbit hole. You know, you know what I'm talking about. And I want you to raise your hand if you've been to uh, a natural history museum in the last six months or so. Seeing a couple hands out there. And re I mean, I was going to ask if, if you've been to a museum at all, but we're in a museum right now. So that's kind of a cop out. <laughs> But I want you to spend a moment, for those of you who raised your hand, and for those of you who didn't, I want you to ask yourself, why do you think people go to museums? And there are a couple different reasons and a couple different uh, explanations that people have for why they go to a museum. Sometimes people go with friends and family. They see it as an opportunity to spend quality time with those that they love and have a shared experience with those people. Other people will say that they go to museums because they actually feel a uh, cultural and societal pressure to go. They feel obligated to go, as if it's just something they need to do. They don't really like it, but they go. Other people are experience seekers, and they have a bucket list of things that they need to see in their life, and they go to the Louvre, and they check off the Louvre, and, and that's kind of how they experience museums. And then there's another group of people who go to museums, and those are, those are the people who, who have questions that they want answers to. They want to see something unique. They want to have a life-changing experience. Those are the explorers. And I want to talk about those people today, the explorers. But first, we have to have a history lesson, because of course, it can't be an academic lecture without a history lesson first. And I want to talk about the history of natural history museums. So natural history museums and museums in general actually have their roots back in the Renaissance, uh, the Age of Enlightenment. As techniques and technologies improved for preserving human and animal remains, so did the uh, insatiable urge for people to begin collecting these oddities. And by collecting physical uh, manifestations and physical objects from the world around them, people uh, began to find enlightenment. Uh, and they had uh, physical representations of their knowledge. So they could amass these giant cabinets, and the more stuff you had and the cooler it was, the more knowledgeable you were. And really, they just started so rich people and academics could show off them to their friends at dinner parties. Look at the two-headed calf that I have. Look at this thing that they didn't yet know was a meteorite, but it was something that uh, was a fiery explosion in the sky and landed on the earth, and they uh, assumed it was perhaps remains of a demon. This is actually what people thought meteorites were. They were demons coming to, the, to, coming to earth. But as these collections grew, they also started to become, become a little more generalized, or a little more specific, I should say, in the types of objects that were being collected. And as they continued to grow, people who were collecting all of these objects saw a, a lucrative opportunity to charge, begin charging the public access to see their things. And that's how the public museum came out of all of this. Because um, who doesn't want to get a little extra money out of the public? So they were charging the public to come in and see the objects, but they didn't have a lot of context when they were on display. It was just mostly, here, here are these things, come look at them. And as a result, as these collections grew, the number of things that could be on display at one time became, of course, limited, both in capacity and, and you can only have so many like brontosauruses on display at one time. So the majority of artifacts that didn't make it on display ended up behind the scenes. 
So where I work at the Field Museum, we really only have 1% of the 26 million objects in our collection on display at one time. So then that, I didn't ever, there's a, whoa, that's, a, you know, that's significant. And so it begs the question, well, what makes it on display? And, and what's not on display? So that's where I come in as chief curiosity correspondent to kind of talk about uh, the things that do make it on display and to also talk about the things that the public won't see when they come. Like this, so there are some things, and first I wanna talk about the stuff that actually makes it on display. And some things are forever destined to be on display in the first place, like uh, animals that are taxidermied for the specific purpose of being in a diorama. And this was a way before anybody could just hop on a plane and go visit an area that they could experience an ecosystem that might not be accessible to them otherwise kind of become immersed in a habitat and become part of a time capsule, not only scientifically, but also culturally, like what was going on and what were the techniques and practices for preserving these things at this time. If you were a student in Illinois in the 1950s and you wanted to learn about the marsh birds of the upper Nile, one, you might never be compelled to look up the marsh birds of the Upper Nile if there was no way for you to experience them yourself. So you came to a natural history museum and then you could stand in front of them and, and start to ask questions of yourself. Like, where are these birds from? How did they get there? Are they still there today? And then you begin to ask more questions of yourself. Like when looking at this picture, I wanna talk about this guy in here. And I don't mean Carl Cotton, the taxidermist, although he is an enigma of himself. I have so many questions about Carl Cotton. I wanna talk about, I wanna talk about this, this, this guy on the right here. This guy, this is a shoe bill. I had never seen a shoe bill in my life until I came to the Field Museum and then stood in front of one. And these are, they were, previously known to be storks, but they're actually more closely related to pelicans, but they look like dinosaurs. I've never seen an angrier looking bird in my life. <laughs> and then I just I started Google, you know, going down that Wikipedia rabbit hole, and you're just like, wow, what is this thing? So that's, those are some of the things that we have on display. You know, just an opportunity for you to enjoy a different environment or eco ecosystem and look at the ecosystem around you and ask questions of it. The other things that we have on display are objects of beauty, things to capture your attention. So this is the sun god opal, which was supposedly mined in Mexico in the 16th century, later ended up in a Persian temple, was purchased by the Hope family, and then ended up in the Field Museum's collection in 1893. So already you have this amazingly compelling object that is one, beautiful, two, mysterious. How do you actually carve a face into an opal? And where did it come from, really? And how did it end up going from a Persian temple to becoming a collection of ours? And so it, it draws people in not only with its beauty, but also its mystery. And where this specimen is, is in the Granger Hall of Gems on display. And the Granger Hall of Gems is a really fascinating place to me because one, it is a gem hall. You walk in and you're like, there's no way I could afford anything in this room ever. <laughs> But the things that are also on display are raw minerals and minerals that have just essentially existed in their natural state. They're beautiful all to themselves, but they're on display with things that have been shaped by our hands. So at one point a human saw this thing that was inherently gorgeous, decided they, they could improve upon it, and then you end up with these things that not only have a geological value, but also a cultural and historic value. So the Granger Hall of Gems is just as much an exhibit about anthropology as it is about geology. So those are some of the things that are on display, but I wanna talk about some of the things that don't make it to the public view. And I'm, I'll tell you they're no less compelling or interesting than the things that are on display, but I already saw some people kind of make some faces in the audience. Because this is an ugly fish. Like, this is an ugly brown fish. Its scientific name is Yavara tahuensensis, and it was first and last described in 1902. And that was the last time it was ever discovered. In fact, the specimen in this picture is the only physical evidence that we have that this animal ever existed on our planet in the first place, and that it ever swam in our rivers and was here for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. We don't even have a fossil of this fish. So this fish isn't just a representation of the ugly minnows that it was a part of, but also of all the other potential animals that we're on our planet that perhaps we never will get an opportunity to explore because this animal's habitat was choked out as Mexico City began to expand. 
So it's been hundreds of years and we still know nothing about this fish. But this fish will never make it on display. Can you imagine this thing in the Hall of Gems? <laughs> this is the part of the Allende meteorite, which was the largest carbonaceous chondrite to ever fall to the surface of the Earth in 1969. And carbonaceous chondrites are stony meteorites, and they are the rarest of the stony meteorites. Less than 5% of meteorites that fall on our planet are, are fall in this category. When geologists cut into this massive meteorite that was about the size of a Volkswagen bug that hit the, hit the Earth, they noticed these inclusions, these kind of white circles, which they had never found in a meteorite before. And they realized that these are calcium-rich inclusions containio, containing aluminum, titanium, and uh, calcium, so they're silicon inclusions. And when they began to study these inclusions, they realized that they contained carbon atoms which could be dated. And they were actually, the carbon atoms extracted from these inclusions are known to be the oldest known matter in our solar system. Because when everything was kind of mixing around in this dusty vortex, you know, the formation of our solar system before the sun was born, these carbon nanodiamonds became included in the surrounding stones that were forming. They dated them to 4.567 billion years ago. And we were actually able to extract them and put them in a vial. And that's my hand. <laughs> I am essentially holding in my hand our collective origins. Every, every part of life, everything around us that is living was, uh, was developed out of these kind of carbon nanodiamonds. These actually are on display, but they're so small and their history is so complicated that a lot of people just walk right by them on their way to check out the sun god opal. I have nothing against the sun god opal. But that's the thing, right? That's the thing about curiosity. You can't be curious about something if you don't know that it exists. That's why we all ought to be chief curiosity <laughs> correspondents. We need these storytellers of our natural environment. If you can get around kind of the noise of your computer and your smartphone, you can start to begin to learn that technology is not what is answering these questions. These Wikipedia uh, rabbit holes that you go down do eventually have an end, but the rabbit hole, the veritable rabbit hole you can follow outside doesn't. It's people that are answering these questions for us. So, thank you.